to talk about Brother Minister, I think that it's over here because nobody we put up here. We talk about an individual who was a master teacher. I think A.P. Bailey said it best. He said it best. You know, there's no greater loss to a community than a master teacher. And this is what he was. He was so brilliant. Of course, history changed because of hate. Because Malcolm wanted to be a lawyer. And if you saw that, watch that clip, that was about presenting his case. He wanted to be a lawyer, but he was told in school because who he was and what he was that he couldn't be a lawyer. Okay? Class president in the eighth grade. It's not a shock. Let's deal with this. One thing about life, life is in phases. And we start thinking about individuals like Brother Minister. His life was in phases. So you're talking about the childhood, and then he started smoking the reapers, and then he started breaking into people's houses. He ended up going to jail in 1946 at age 20 for his 21st birthday. And he spent six years in prison. Man couldn't read based on some test score. But when he came out of prison, Elijah Muhammad did something very powerful. He made him the only person for the nation of Islam, 1952, 53, something like that. And what he did is he started going around the country building a mosque in different cities, such as Boston, Washington, D.C., Chicago. He was already there. That's where the headquarters were. Los Angeles. <coughs> Pay attention to the city of Los Angeles. Okay. Philadelphia. But what's interesting is New York. Why is New York important? Because one, New York is the mecca. It's the, it's the uh, largest city in this country. It's the media capital of the world. So we start thinking about Brother Minister, and this is important. Okay. Does anybody know how tall Brother Minister was? This add two, two inches to me. I'm 6'2", being 6'4". The speech, the conviction. You know, one thing about Brother Minister, he had a conviction where he, he, you know he meant what he said, and he said what he meant. And what's interesting with, with, with young people, especially young women, they're very fascinated with, with Malcolm X. Talking about how fine he is. Listen to what he's saying. Talking about how fine he is. Come on. But I understand because he has so much charisma. We talking about that was 50, 53 years ago. And the things that were said, we're still dealing with today. Are we dealing with police brutality? Are we, st are, are we dealing with um, some of those, those racialists he talks about in the U.S. Senate and the Congress? Yes. You think about 1964 and what was going on. That's the same month that Sam Cooke was murdered in 64. Now, we think about our lecture on Tuesday when we talk about Muhammad Ali, how they were all together earlier that year. Okay, But at this time, him and Ali had a split. And Ali had to make a decision. Is he going to go with Elijah Muhammad? Or is he going to go with Brother Minister? And there were two people that Brother Minister wanted to take with him. There was Muhammad Ali. Louis Farrakhan. And Farrakhan was his protege. And a lot of times when you see, when he was in the nation, and you see him speaking, I always look not just at the person, I look behind the scenes, the pictures. Farrakhan is standing right on the side, either his right shoulder or left shoulder, young Louis Farrakhan. Farrakhan learned all this stuff from him. Okay. But then when the split came. Now, why was the split caused? Does anybody know why the split happened? What's the word that's up on the board? Jealousy. How tall was Malcolm? Where was he at? What city? New York. New York. And he was a spokesperson, and he was 
in front of the cameras. And he could articulate the message and he spoke with a conviction. See, when you don't have those attributes, when you don't have the charisma, when you don't have the height of speech, complexion is important sometimes. You, you don't put ugly people in front of the people. Do you? You put a good looking person in front of the people. He was a good looking man. I'm comfortable with my own skin, so I can say that. But he, he was passionate and he had love for black people. And where does this jealousy come in? See, see, 1963, oh, there were a lot of things that happened. But let, let me go back to 62, because I mentioned the city, Los Angeles. That's when the, the friction began to start. And people tend to overlook what happened in 62. And um, anybody from Los Angeles in the room? OK, that's great. The mosque in Los Angeles. The secretary of the mosque there was, 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 um, was Ronald Stokes. And Ronald Stokes, there was a raid by the police. And they had the, the particular mosque under surveillance. The police came out. The brothers were carrying dry cleaning. There was an altercation. There were shots fired. And Brother Ronald Stokes was murdered. So Malcolm and his people went out to Los Angeles. And when he went out there, basically, he felt that these individuals should be prosecuted. They were cops. So there was a grand jury. And the grand jury came back with justifiable homicide. Now, because I'm being filmed, I can't say what Malcolm said in front of the people at the church, because he wanted to bring a united front with all the black groups. Because he talked about where the cops shot Ronald Stokes at, and some of the other brothers. It's a particular part of the body that's sensitive to men, so you figure it out. But the idea is that, you know, you, that should tell you the mindset of the police department. Malcolm felt that we need to do something. We should not let this die. Elijah Muhammad felt otherwise. They felt that our lie would could have been built, straight things out. And a lot of times you get frustrated because we're talking about 62. And then what happened in 63 with the bombing of the church? See, there's so many things that um, happen. You begin to look at places in time. And you start thinking about September 63. And then what happened uh, 60 days later, 60, 67 days later. President Kennedy is assassinated. Malcolm takes questions. And basically he states the comment that you've heard it, you've done research on him. Basically the chicken's coming home to roost because all the assassination that taken place. Now there's an excellent book. If you ever want to know the history of the murder of Malcolm X, that you need to read. And I've read, I read it 25 years ago, and I still remember some of the excerpts. It's called The Judas Factor. Plot to murder Malcolm X. And in that book, they talk about these, what I'm talk, telling you right now, but they have um, actual FBI documents because they were bugging Elijah Muhammad and some of the other people within the nation. So after Malcolm made the statement, chickens coming home to roost, he was silenced by, silenced by the nation as well. And at that same time, Muhammad Ali is preparing for what? His fight against Sonny Liston in February of 64. So the silence is supposed to be 90 days. Now let's do it. This was Friday the president was murdered, 22nd of November. He met with Elijah Muhammad that weekend The silence for 90 days. So 90 days is what? March, February, what is it? From November to what? 90 days is what? Is it February or March? It's February. It's February. So March 8th, he makes a, has a press conference because he realized that his silence was going to basically be in. But it's hard when you are the spokesperson for an organization and people want your opinion, news organizations, others about different issues, and you can't say anything. So who took Malcolm's place after he was silenced? 
Farrakhan. Who said that? Okay, Mr. Monroe. Okay, Farrakhan took his place. Okay. I wish sometimes I give things away and I shouldn't. I had the actual Muhammad speaks before it became the final call from the, like 1964, 65. And in those newspapers, they were writing comments. Benedict Arnold, Judas, about the person who helped that newspaper get started was Brother Minister. It goes back to the jealousy. And you can ask yourself, wait a minute. If he's speaking for the nation of Islam, where is the jealousy coming from? Do you think it was just within the nation of Islam? No. Okay. He made some very disparaging comments about different groups of people while he was in the nation, but once he got out of the nation, he began to speak for himself. And so when he was asked by some of the comments that he made about different groups of people, he said, I was speaking as a spokesperson for the nation of Islam. Now I can share with you my own opinion about certain things. But before he met with those people, he took the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. They had an orthodox form of Islam. And he came back a different person. See, that's another phase. And he was going into this phase. Now, I'm going to ask you something. Based on that video you just watched, and that's the debate in Oxford, England, on race, what's the most important thing he stated? It was at the end of the video. Most important thing he stated, it was at the end. What, let me ask you this. What does this country try to do with people? To control, control people? What? Okay, but there's something else. See? Thank you. And what did he state? He said that he wanted to work with anybody. He didn't care what color you were just so we can clean up this miserable condition on the face of this earth. Now, I put approximately 80 days. I don't know if it's 80 days from um, December 3rd to February 21st. How many days is it? Look it up on your phone. I don't know. If it's 28 days left in the month of, of December, and then there's 31 days in January, and then there's, I don't know how many days is that. I don't know. Is it 80? I don't know. But the idea is that um, he had 80 days left. Now, what's interesting about it was when he was murdered, there was a, 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 a planned conference of world revolutionaries that was scheduled in March of 1965. He was killed February 21st, Sunday, February 21st, 1965. Now, what happened a week before he was murdered? Anybody know? That's when they firebombed his home. And he lost everything. Now, I want you to think, put this in perspective. Okay, they firebombed his home on the 15th of February. Okay, he flies to Detroit. His clothes still smell the only suit he could get. Flies to Detroit and gives a speech for two hours. He talks about his life, what he's trying to do. Now, he has planned trips coming up in Paris and London. They wouldn't let him get off the plane. That's what he knew, this thing, this plot term. And so he was telling Haley, who, Alex Haley, who wrote the book, The Autobiography of Michael Max, I only got a week to live. Now, before you even ask me, because this question comes up all the time, why don't he just go somewhere else? One thing you must understand about assassinations, the ones who were murdered, they know when it's their time. It's not anything they can do about it. And what they do is they tell their loved ones, make sure my family's taken care of. Because see, Malcolm had six daughters. <coughs> he only saw four. Because when Sister Be when he was killed, Sister Betty was pregnant with the twins. They were born that summer of 65. Jealousy. 39 years. We lost some great ones in the 60s, man. This, one, this, this guy here, his spirit is powerful. And I'm going to tell you why his spirit is so powerful. Because you have people who take classes like this that have never discussed anything about this problem. 
why I've been reading African American studies and never learned from my brother Minister. And you should ask yourself why. And I think it's an insult that that would occur. Because his fear is so powerful, powerful because he speaks. And, and if you notice, when you listen to this video, and I like playing it, he made the reference to 1924, 1954, and he mentioned another year. Now, this, this was 64, but he mentioned three years. 24, 54, and 1984. 84. He would be dead 80 days. For him to even think about that, because that's the vision that he had. He was a visionary, he was an educator. He was, he was a prophet. I mean, this dude, he was so brilliant. Any questions so far? Where would be dope? Um, I've read somewhere that uh, Bobby Johnson had offered to be Malcolm X's bodyguard. Malcolm X turned down. Malcolm X. Oh, you talking about on the door when they were supposed to be guarding the door, or be his bodyguard? He had a bodyguard who was um, informing for the um, New York Police Department, named Stanley Roberts. Okay. And he told the police department he just saw a driver on on Malcolm's life the week before, because that 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 um, Saturday it was a dance. It was um, Valentine's Day at the Audubon. And we're supposed to be bodyguards on the door. And what's uh, interesting. I don't know what year. Uh, what do you think? I think, I mean, he he had a lot of connections around New York, so. You think he would have lived longer? I'm smiling because um, what I just said, I stand by what I said in reference to when it's this time, when they know they know. It's nothing they can do. It's already, okay, because you have to think about the events coming up. See, Malcolm, the week before this happened, he was in cell. He was invited by Brother Kwame Ture to speak to people, because Dr. King was in jail, to speak to these uh, marchers, because you know he was trying to um, march the vote, march the um, vote, protest the vote, the right to vote. The black men in the South, they could vote. Black people could vote. But then, in order for you to vote, you had to go through a poll tax, which was a test. And they one of the questions on the test was how many um, um, beans are in the 12-ounce can of beans. That was part of it. And a lot of people who gave you the poll tax couldn't read themselves. And if the person who was the, um, the, um, the testing examiner had a good day, then you could vote. So that's what he was alluding to when he was giving that speech on race. So your, your assessment in reference to um, bodyguards, no. it was going to happen eventually. Okay, and he knew it. Okay, and he was telling people, I'm going to live a week. They were going to deal with it. See, when you start talking about spiritual things, it's kind of difficult for people to stay silent. Okay? Because he has love for people, that's difficult to do. That's hard. But even though they physically killed him, his spirit is still with us. And so that's something that's very powerful. And there are some people who, when they heard the news that he was assassinated, my mother, she went to the hospital. 
my angelou came back from Africa to work with him, and she was told that he had been murdered because she wasn't listening to the radio. She stayed in the apartment. She went through a, 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 a serious depression. That's how impactful he was because people loved the guy. But there was also another element, and that goes back to jealousy. And you might wonder, why would somebody want to be jealous of this individual? Because they didn't have the acumens that he had. Okay. Any questions so far? Ronald, you got one? Any questions? I, th I think I have a question. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it. When it, okay. comes to, when it comes to the jealousy part, yes, I remember some of the stuff is still kind of vague, vague, you know, that when this happened, did they try to blame it on, on um, Minister Farrakhan? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, when they were plotting the murder, it was at the New Jersey mosque, okay? Farrakhan was there, but he didn't pull the trigger. He admitted that himself. He admitted that, and this song, if you pull up Minister Farrakhan, in fact, it's on one of the things I have, um, him and his, um, Malcolm's oldest daughter, I don't know, being interviewed by Mike Wallace, mm -hmm. he admitted, because see, people don't have to pull the, pull, pull the trigger, but you're just as guilty because you create the climate. And when you're talking about a zealot, that's a loyal follower. And that loyal follower would do anything because they're following the man, man and not a God. And that's why. And you got zealots right now in this country. Everything that he's saying is going on right now in America. They call them lackeys. That's the new term that they use. Zealot followers. Farrakhan did not pull the trigger, folks. And there are a lot of people that do not like Farrakhan to this day because of what happened. A lot of those older heads. No, take that back. Because I got a student that's 25. I can't even mention Farrakhan in class because, you know, he, he loses it. Okay? He loses it. Because of Something had happened, he wasn't even born yet. But a lot of people that were around at that time, they still carry this with them. Because we always think about what ifs. We always do. You know, your question alluded that, you know, we always think about if this would occur, you know, I do it, man. I do it. Alex Haley in his book, in his autobiography with Alex Haley, and he writes the last time he met with Haley in person, because the last couple of times they talked on the phone, basically to finish up. And that last chapter is 1965 before the epilogue, and, and Alex Haley had to finish it up. There's a quote that I can't, I can't use the term, but I'll say this. It refers to black people and what they call themselves, a term, this is a derogatory term that they use to call themselves, it begins with an And he said they ruined it because they had something good. And Haley was shocked because he had never heard Malcolm talk like that. But he was so hurt because of betrayal, because when you believe in somebody, you ever believe in somebody? And you come to find out that you believed in them so much and they let you down. And that's how he felt. But it wasn't just, um, it was people within the life of his family that were jealous of him as well because they didn't like the fact that when they needed an opinion, you called on the spokesperson. They weren't calling them, they were calling the brother minister because he was so articulate. I mean, he was so smart. He was brilliant. 
Did and his trip to Mecca yes. influence a lot of stuff that, about him and how people treated him? You're talking about after he came back? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes it did. Because, because if you go back to the, the clip, he wanted to work with everybody. In fact, there was a meeting, 1965, January 65. Um, you guys know who Sidney Partier is, the actor? Mm -hmm. Okay, his wife, Juanita, at the time, Juanita Partier, Partier had a meeting in her, her place. And all the representatives from CORE, NAACP, STIC, SCLC, different groups converged on the house. Dr. King was supposed to be there, but he couldn't, so he sent somebody. And basically what he wanted to do was have a conversation with all the mistakes that he had made and all that good stuff. And what he was trying to do to move black people forward, to make this world a better place. What's interesting to know, there's a young lady, I say young, she's no longer with us. She passed away in 2014 at the age of 99. Her name is Yuri Kochiyama. She's Japanese. What people don't realize about Brother Minister is he was working with the Japanese to try to get reparations for being in a place in internment camps during World War II. And she was there in the Audubon when he was murdered. And they're born on the same day, along with the great Lorraine Hansberry, who passed away in January of 65, and Malcolm went to her funeral. But, she, but going back to Yuri Kochiyama, she tells a story about um, when she told her family that she knew Malcolm. And they were like, you don't know Malcolm X. They said, yeah, are you with him? So there was a knock on the door. And they answer the door, and they see this tall black guy, and it's Malcolm X. So his stretch, his reach, was far and wide. And what was interesting about Brother Minister is when he didn't went to and did the Hodge, you think he just went to Mecca? He was meeting with heads of state in Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Ghana. Remember with, um, in Kuma? Because you know Ghana had just got their independence in 1957. We're talking about an eighth, an eighth grade education. This guy meeting with heads of state. And the powers the big said, we got to stop this. Uh-uh. So Ms. Lawrence, him coming back, okay, and then he made other trips. And he was on a special with James Farmer, who was the head of Corps, who did who was still doing the Freedom Rides. And he thought that Malcolm was just a loud mouth. After that meeting, on the, I don't know if it was Meet the Press, I don't know, because I wasn't even born. But the idea, I know y'all think I was, but I wasn't. <laughs> All right? But it was one of those shows. He said, you see, um, he said Malcolm was loud, but he was right on the money. But they developed a bond. And so Malcolm went over there and he said, look, make sure you take care of James Bond. Now, when Malcolm would go to Africa, he would go to uh, Ghana, he would go to Nigeria, he would go to Libya, all these places. And there were so many Americans over there, they would look forward to when he would come over there, and they would just talk about trying to make this world a better place. What is wrong with that? What is wrong with trying to make this world a better place? Can you explain it to me? Can you explain it? See, this is the passion that the older heads I'm not no older head, okay? This is the passion the older heads have. People in their 50s and their 60s and their 70s, this is what they have, okay? Why can't we, why do we have a problem with people that want to make the world a better place? Can you explain that? Abdul, can you explain it? Can anybody explain to me why do we want to? Ms. Creighton, sister from Los Angeles, you want to explain to the class why do we have a problem with making the people that are trying to make the world a better place like Brother Minister? Maybe because people have different views on what a better place is exactly. Like maybe some people think a better place means all, like, all the black people are out of the country or just different stuff, like different opinions on what a better place might be. Everyone's like different views on how people different things that they want. Okay, he stated in the video, you know, these individuals who are chairpersons of these different committees, 
don't have the best interests of mankind. Stay. That's why I like playing. Because it's so relevant today. You got that much jealousy in your heart where you want to put 17 bullets in something? Yeah, I said 17. I said 17. I did not start. When you put 17 bullets in a human being, you make sure we can't just kill them. We just got to annihilate them. Something is wrong here, man. And that's why people were so devastated because, you know, Dick Gregory <coughs> passed away, made the transition. He was supposed to be at the Audubon and didn't show up. And he was interviewed about it. He said because he knew that they were going to take him out. He didn't want to be there. This is something that we have to ask ourselves. You know, and that's why I can understand why some of the older heads get upset because they think about what this guy was trying to do. Trying to bring people together. That's a problem. Here's a picture of my mother. I think I had that picture too. And she's sitting there. And so, as she, she was in my grandmother's house, and so, as maybe I was dating at the time, she comes in the house and she said, Why is your mother from Malcolm X? And I'm thinking, What are you talking about? I'm saying to myself, and then I look. I said, No, that's, that's, that's dead. Even what it made me think. Oh, okay. Because I know how she felt, and I know how other people felt. But like I said, it's that what Miss Crane said. It's another side. You ready, Abdullah? Um, Go ahead. I heard a story about when Malcolm X came back from my country, and he talked to the heads of the Nation of Islam in America, and he said that you know Muslims are just not black. You know mm -hmm. we have. Arab Muslims, white Muslims, you know, Asian Muslims, and they said, what are you talking about right now? You know, you're kind of, you're kind of choosing the wrong way, and that's one of the reasons that led him to get killed, and I'm not sure about the story. Well, I will tell you this, because he came back um, in May, he came back after his birthday because he turned 39 in 1964. They had already started putting a plot together to kill him in 63, in December 63. In fact, there was a high-speed chase in Los Angeles um, <coughs> in the fall of 64. I wasn't there. Just letting you know. I'm just saying that it was a high-speed chase. So just think about the things that were taking place at the time and all the things that transpired a few years, a year later. See. In 64, Malcolm had met with Mike Wallace, the interview, and he talked about how there's going to be more civil unrest because when oppressed people are, have been oppressed for so long, they're going to get sick and tired. And so he had went over to uh, back to Africa, and when he came back, he was interviewed. They were trying to blame him for all the uprisings. Like, you can't blame me. I told you this was going to happen because people are going to get sick and tired. The young people today are tired of being pushed around. They're tired of police brutality. Okay, are we still dealing with that in 2017? Yes. yes. What's going on in St. Louis? Yes. Satan Lewis? <laughs> That's why I used to say, uh, respect for Mr. Brooks. Uh, you know, Brother Rudy? I have a question. I have an answer. Last time I have an opinion, then I have a question. You said my opinion or your no, opinion? I'm going to share my opinion, then I have a question leading up to it. So when I was younger, my grandma used to make this comment to me all the time. What she I said? I never understood what it meant. She said that white people were the devil. And now my question is, well, I know they're not the devil, but at the at the time when she grew up. How old is your grandma? She just turned 80 on. Like last week, she okay, was 13 years old. So she was born in 1937. Mm -hmm. okay. well, anyways, my, my question is to you, at, at any point, did you ever feel that way? No. You know why? 
play. Because of where I grew up at um, in Chicago, in Hyde Park, I grew up around a lot of um, people that were from all over the world. Okay. I seen so many different things when I was young. I saw it was around gay people, interracial couples. So that broadened my horizon about dealing with people. Okay. So it's I can interact with people from all over, be comfortable, and it's not a problem. But the thing is, with me, I know who I am. I'm comfortable with my own skin. I don't hate nobody. Okay, and I would say you don't hate nobody, love yourself. Okay, because there's a lot of good people who happen to be white, and there's a lot of bad people that happen to be black. And some of them in your family. And I don't miss words when I say it. When you take an intro class with me, you will find out. Okay, I don't miss words at all. And so, and, and Brother Minister found out, that's why that phase, that last phase, okay, of his life, and he started, he had the power. See, people always wonder why. They, they, they use this term, but it's easy to use racist. You don't even know what a racist is. Shut up. Most people in this, 80% of the people in this country don't even know what a racist is. They say a 14-year-old racist. 14-year-old ain't got um, control over your job situation or your life. How can you be a racist? A 12-year-old racist. Give me a break. Yeah, what I'm saying. But the point I'm trying to make to you is when you start looking at um, trying to bring people together, mm -hmm. there's always going to be problems. And, and Brother Malcolm and, and, and Dr. King were killed because they had the power to bring people together. That's why you got to look at Dr. King, the last speeches of his life. When he was at the United Nations after he spoke out against the Vietnam War in April, he was at the United Nations. Look at the audience. The majority of the people in the audience are white. The powers that be say, we got to stop this. We, we got to stop this. The last thing he stated, I'm willing to work with anybody. And see, his thing was, he was 39. You got a legion of young people who were like your grandmother. Okay, who were coming behind and saying, that's my man. Yuri Kochiyama was the same age he women with women. No, she was four years older than him. No, she was five years older than him. Five, she was born 1920. She's Japanese. Mm -hmm. She said, Malcolm is her guy. That's the reach he had. That's why. See, we discredit you first. You can't do it that way, then we find other ways. We find other ways. Can I answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't hate nobody, you love yourself. That's all you got. That's all you got, man. And that's why you, when you study him, you study him in phases. Because what he said in 1960 is totally different than what he said in 64, May of 64. Now, specifically, because that's when he came back from Mecca. He was 39. Okay. And you, in your life, your young life, as you get older 10 years from now, you're going to think totally different than you do now. Okay. Do world events have something to do with that? Yes. Okay. And see, the, another reason to go back to the jealousy, you're talking about people that were older than him, he influenced the people that was in his generation, the silent generation, and then you're talking about the boomers behind him. And once he was, was murdered, the generation I'm in, Generation X, the spirit, his spirit, because see, even me teaching this, sometimes I think I know, but something might peak me. I got to go back and check this. Something, something might happen, I might be watching something, and, and there's something I say, okay, I thought I knew more. I need to go back and check something here. Or there might be somebody doing other research that I guess, let me check this out. Wow. This is, this is powerful. Because I didn't really think about I didn't look at that angle. 
Okay. So we think we know. And I'm going to say this because um, there was a guy who's no longer with us named Manny Marble. He's a um, professor, used to be a professor at Columbia. He died in 2011. He wrote a book about Brother Minister that was scathing to tell about um, some, some things that were inappropriate in his life. I said, well, you know, because you've got to really think, what's the motivation? Okay? And he died before the book, um, book sign happened because there were a lot of people that was going to chew him a new one. So C-SPAN had to change their schedule, and they had an open forum where sister poet Sonia Sanchez, who was another person who um, was under the tutelage of Brother Minister, and, some, and the co-authors of this book on a panel, I said, oh, this is going to be good. And she lit into them like a black woman can take you to the woodshed when she is angry to let them know that you should be ashamed of yourself writing this trash. Because if a book comes out about him and they're making these, these new revelations, really? Who, who was Buddy, Brother Minister? Say a lot of them so everybody can hear you. The FBI. Thank you. When did they start bugging him? You know that? I'll tell you. 1952. As soon as he got out of prison. Yeah. No, let me take that back. They were bugging. They were already while checking him out while he was still in prison. Still in prison. See? Yeah. So do you think that they gonna hold on to these revelations some 50 years after he is murdered? They would have came out that with that while he was still alive. So when you hear this, we, we have new revelations, shocking new details. Nice. Are you kidding me? Let me talk to you behind the scenes. How much they paying you to write this book? That's the question I would ask. Because if the FBI is bugging you, they want you. And I'm going to take that a step further because we talk about the FBI and the nation in love. The Secretary of the Nation of Islam, his name is John Ali. If you read the book, The Judas Factor, John Ali was an FBI informant. And there's documents in there. In fact, I have a little tape, Carl Evans, who's the author of that book. He contacted the FBI and asked, was that a boy? There was a fire at Muhammad Ali's home. The FBI knew before Ali did. See, this is all the stuff that you have to deal with. If you are going to be a person that's going to lead the people, if you're going to be a person that's trying to change the world and make the world a better place, and you're out the front, they're going to start trying to discredit you. Start checking your bank account, bank records. So be double when you um, try to lead the people. They're going to find out that you Grandmaster B. That's the handle you use on your Twitter account. <laughs> if you're a White Sox fan, I don't know why you're wearing that. <laughs> okay. They're going to find out all the things that you like, all the indiscretions. And that's what they, they do. And what's beautiful, man, Mo, they couldn't stop. Can I, talk to, can I tell y'all a story about Dr. King and the FBI? Do you mind? I know this is Malcolm today, but i got to share this with you. Can, you, you don't mind, do you? Or oh, y'all want me to? Uh, no, no, we I want you to tell you. Okay, now, this is a true story. I, I gotta go back to I wasn't there, 1967. 67. Jay Hoover calls Dr. King. Well, me there. Now mind you, Dr. King knows that Hoover's been bugging him. That's called electronic surveillance for you sophisticated folks. So he goes up to Washington and meets with Mr. Hoover. And after he meets with Mr. Hoover, he comes out, you know, an eloquent Dr. King. Well, Mr. Hoover says some things, and he's pretty eloquent. Basically, Mr. Hoover basically told Dr. King, you need to commit suicide. Because you're a fraud. Because you're what? A fraud. F-R-A-U-D. A fraud. Fraud. Man, you talking about it. And shortly after, in 68, what happens? He dies. He gets murdered. No, Miss Miss Lawrence. Well, he's, murdered. he's murdered. His life is cut short. Yeah, that's what I should say. Okay. Yeah. See, so 
Bonus is just all of this, you know, you got the different layers. Okay. So do you stop talking to the people? No. Do you stop leading? Sometimes people are going to criticize you. You continue doing what you're doing. And in fact, what's interesting is that Brother Minister told Dr. King that if you stay on your, your position of nonviolence, you'll be discredited by your own people. And that's exactly what happened. Because the young people were sick and tired of that philosophy. But for 15 years, they respected it. Malcolm was 39, right? When he was assassinated? Mm -hmm. How old was Dr. King? 39. 39. How old was Meg Evans? 37. 37. There's a show on ESPN that used to call Numbers Don't Lie. Those numbers don't lie. And if you think I'm just using that or just talking off the top of my head, go research it yourself. Now I'm going to ask you something. Mr. Monroe, why are people in 2016-17 afraid of Brother Minister Malcolm X when he's been dead for 50, 40, 53 years? Is it 53? 52, excuse me. Why? You don't know? Uh, probably because they scared of the change. He's deceased. He joined the Six Feet and Under group. Oh, wait a minute. Can the spirit slap you? Yes. How can the spirit slap you? By telling the truth. Oh, you scared of the spirit? Everything, everything he said was true. I can't see the spirit. <laughs> Read his book. <laughs> <laughs> the spirit, so what is it? Is the spirit, Mr. Monroe? Not like you know. Uh, his aura. Not like. No, 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 Yeah, I know what you mean. I'm just teasing, man. No. Not the spirit, not the ghost, no. No. But, 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 but you're right, the spirit. The spirit is powerful. Okay? It's extremely powerful. And that's something that we have to understand. When, uh, was Malcolm X and uh, Martin Luther King supposed to get together? They were supposed to do like something together. They were supposed to. I'm glad you put it that way. They were supposed to. But you have to understand that there were forces that were trying to keep them apart. And they were very successful at that. Because see, as Malcolm was come, came back and he was told totally, he was a changed man and wanted to work with everybody, Dr. King was looking at like, you know, more direct action. And so if you think about 1965, you're talking about the voting rights act. That was self. Okay. He goes to Chicago, starts marching for open housing. Then what Dr. King did, which we really got him taken out of here, speaking about the Vietnam War, he started comparing the Vietnam War to the war on poverty. Mm -hmm. That's money. That's economics, man. Okay? See. Taking down signs, black and white, didn't change nothing. Right to vote didn't cost no money. But when you start talking about the Vietnam War and the war on poverty, oh, no, no, no. That's foreign affairs. And they always would tell Dr. King, you a middle class preacher, son. You ain't supposed to be speaking. And then he was, he was young. So the problem is. And see, Dr. King was 5'8". But he was a good looking man. See, see how, see how those are interchangeable? They both attractive. They both intelligent. The ladies love them. Really, the ladies <laughs> love them. Okay, I got I got students now talking about Malcolm Fine. Malcolm dead. <laughs> no problem. But I understand. Because the the charisma, the love. Okay. Talking about she wanted to date him. How you gonna date somebody dead in four years? Sure, problem. How much time I got? Can I ask you one more question? Okay, wait, wait a minute. He's got one more question. 
One more question, because y'all might be scared of Malcolm too when y'all don't come up <laughs> <laughs> Scared to see. I'll be telling all the other stuff we talking about. What y'all doing? Don't talk about mountains. I don't know. We ain't do nothing. Scared of mountains. Lord Jesus. Go ahead, Miss Lawrence. Wait, hold on. I gotta say this. Malcolm, what will Malcolm do with cell phones? What is this? Oh, it's fun. Malcolm makes a cell phone. Hello. Here you go. Go ahead, Ms. Lawrence. My question, I don't know if it pertains to class or not, but something that, that's been on my mind lately, it, and it, it's a part of this class in history, was um, uh, Black Wall Street. Yeah, 1921. June 1st, May 31st, June 1st, 1921. And that was in That Oklahoma? was in Tulsa, Oklahoma which is now Interstate 44 runs through there out of St. Louis. So the, the thing that I, I guess the thing that I'm getting at is that black people have always been innovative and knew how to do stuff, but white people couldn't stand the fact that we might have something. Ms. Lawrence, Ms. Lawrence, there's a word up on the board. Jealousy. Okay, and what people don't realize is say, what people don't realize is that what was done to those people in Tulsa, United States Army, United States Air Force dropped bombs on those people. A lot of people lost their lives. We're talking about Black Wall Street. You had that, you had 1923 Rosewood, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so there was a lot of things that took place. And you fast forward, and it's still going on. You have to ask yourself, why? There's a term I use in intro, so it's called learning to be prejudiced. Yeah. Okay? And when people learn to be prejudiced, which is a negative attitude about your biological makeup, that's a problem. That's a problem. Do they have an epiphany? Yes, they do. Because they are in a situation where they have a life-altering experience or a life change. And that same person who they were prejudiced towards because of their biological makeup Maybe the one that might change their life. I don't have time to share a story with you because I can't because it's too much time because it's too much layers. But it's something that happened after Charlottesville, and I'll share it with you mm -hmm. on Tuesday because it, it, it was two 18-year-old boys, okay, and they took. Oh, how much time we got? Five, what is it? Five or one? Okay, look. Okay. No, five. You got one fifteen? You got one fifteen. Yeah, six minutes. Okay, okay. I still don't I still don't have time because y'all be asking questions. I do? Okay, look. There were two eighteen year old boys. And they, what they did is they um they were they were on this road and a neighbor saw them. and the new car was driving slow. And so he didn't, he didn't think he got thing of it. So his neighbor came home, put him to a driveway. And mind you, the, the, the um, houses have cameras all, with all this technology. So the camera was just facing the, facing the um, driveway. It wasn't facing the mailbox. And on the mailbox, they put a swastika on the mailbox. OK, you guys know what a swastika is? Yeah. All right. See, see these, these people who are prejudiced are so stupid, they didn't even get the right um, the right symbol, racist symbol, right? Anyway, because it's a black family, uh, and, and the wife is a, a nurse practitioner, and the, and, the, and the husband is a driver. So he asked his asked the, um, his neighbor, who happened to be white, did you? Um, I can't. My camera couldn't couldn't detect this. You can you can you check and see my camera? So he got camera. Yeah, and he saw the car. It was the neighbor down the street. And their son, their son and his family were driving the car. So they went down the street, they talked to the neighbor, they said, um, we want to show you something. They showed him the camera. 
And so the neighbor said, well, what you going to do about it? He said, well, you know, I, I don't want any problems. He said, I'll tell you what, you send that to me. And it was white. So he took it. He took it to the police station. They came out and arrested the son. And then they went out went and got his friend and took his friend in. Now his friend, who put the, put the swastika on the house, on the mailbox, his sister is married to a black man. Got two kids. It gets better. Mind you, these, these people have been living on this block for 10 years. Remember I said that the wife was a nurse practitioner. Get practitioner. Get to that in a moment. So the family, they told the family, the family came over, and the kids, his nephew started around. You hate us this much? They asked the husband, his brother-in-law, you hate us this much? No, I don't hate you. Boys crying and everything. Okay. The nurse practitioner, when them boys were eight years old, one of them had a busted head. She treated them. Ten years later, they did this. Well, it gets better. So, in this neighborhood, this is in Michigan, outside of Detroit. Um, there's a Dairy Queen. So, one of the boys showed up at the Dairy Queen. The guy knew about it, told him, get the hell out. We don't want your kind here. Hey, love. So, they were trying to repent. They went to a black church, talked to a pastor, said, you know, we, we did this. We, we ashamed ourselves. We're sorry. What can we do? They said, what you can do is you can speak to the congregation. I don't know what happened because I haven't talked to my cousin yet. He's going to let me know. But I do know this, that they have friends who are black. So their friends told them, we'll go to church with you because we don't want you to get lynched. Okay. So somebody in the media got a hold of the story. And they went out to the house with the nurse practitioner and it happened. And they didn't really want to talk about it because they wanted to basically move on. The moral story is, is that you're going to have people like this in all walks of life. How you handle it is a different story. Okay, you can handle it one way, or you can handle it the other way. But if you handle it in class, down the road, it'll benefit you in the long run. Is it tough? Yes, yeah, tough. Especially when you're dealing with thieves. Okay.